morning, church. Uh, let us all settle down. Okay. Let us all rise as we sing Holy, Holy, Holy. all be seated. John 8, verse 36 says, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amidst the many teachings of people on how to set ourselves free, we can only experience true freedom in Christ. Because of who He is, because He is victorious, the chains of sin and slavery are broken for us and we are forgiven. Because he is the Prince of Peace, our hearts and minds can rest in him. Because his love is amazing, we can experience the joy of serving him and loving him, praising him for all of our days. What more can we ask for, right? So I hope that today we would celebrate the true and genuine freedom that we can only enjoy in the presence of our awesome, holy, and mighty God. Thank you. 
Please rise as we come to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again, thank you for graciously favoring us with another Sunday morning today. To be to come to you in prayer with praise and thanksgiving. In prayer, we come before your awesome presence in this place to bless your holy name, to worship you in truth and in spirit, and to be reminded once again of how great you are. Indeed, you are great. Because you are our God, who is all-powerful, ever all-knowing all and ever-present. We give you all the praise and the thanks because of who you are. We recognize your graciousness, your kindness, your goodness, your holiness, justice, mercy and compassion. We praised you by proclaiming by proclaiming your glory in everything that we do. And uh, we praise you not because you fulfill the desires of our hearts but because you and you alone fulfill us. Again, with humble and contrite hearts, we ask for the forgiveness of our sins. Even we know that we are saved through faith by grace and the blessed assurance that we have in the hope in your Son, Jesus Christ. We confess that we are still humans, prone to, prone to stumble, prone to stumble and deviate and transgress from the right path towards where you want us to be, to be holy because you are holy. Help us in our struggle to sin less and less in the building of the spiritual discipline in our spiritual walk and journey, especially when we face numerous continuing challenges in our day-to-day -day earthly obligations to our family and friends, in our work and businesses, in our study, and when dealing with our fellow believers, more so with non-believers. We thank you that we can, that we are staying alive, keeping well in our physical and mental well-being during this pandemic. Especially now, we are in the lowest alert level. We thank you that we have been allowed this privilege of this online, our on-site physical worship service, more freedom of movements, and permitting us every aspect of our lives to gradually move toward normalcy. And we also pray that the lessons that we have learned during the pandemic that we will apply them like second nature. Lord, we commit to you this worship service, that through this worship service, that you will let us, let our, the eyes of our hearts be opened so that we can see what you want us to see, so we can hear what you want us to hear. We pray that you will fill our hearts, our soul, and our mind. Transform us to be like you more and more. And finally, we pray that you will speak to us, Lord, to hear and be blessed by your holy word. Through your servant, minister, Pastor uh, Joselito Chua. May his message be like seeds that will fall on the good soil of our hearts, that they may go deep 
and grow within our hearts. And all of these we pray in the mighty, wonderful name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. seat okay so our uh, speaking pastor okay for today is uh, pastor uh, Joselito Chua he's uh, from uh, Caloacan Christian Baptist Church and uh, if uh, my recollection serves me well I think the last time that he spoke to us was in January 2020 that was last year more than a year ago and that was on online <laughs> So it's really a joy, okay, and a privilege to have him, to have him, no? Speak to us physically, <laughs> okay. Good, mo Good morning. Oh, okay. <laughs> Blessed Lord's Day, Blessed Lord's Sunday to everyone. Uh, I understand that the pastor, Pastor Dime, is uh, abroad. <laughs> so um, uh, I made sure that I would come. I, I understand that there are sometimes pastors who would speak online, online I mean through video. But uh, so I brought my family with me. Yeah, so my wife and my daughter uh, here. So um, anyway, thank you once again for the opportunity to share God's Word with you this morning. Uh, yes, the last time I spoke with you was online. And it's really a joy for us as pastors to finally be able to speak face-to-face, -face, uh, of course, to our own congregation and even to other congregations, to be able to fellowship with you, right? So let's praise the Lord for that. And uh, hopefully this will continue on until we're able to uh, gather everyone uh, to the place of worship. Now, have you ever been called a hypocrite? Or have you ever called someone a hypocrite? Now, chances are you might say, Pastor, you know, Boksu haven't really called anyone that name. You know why? Because those are strong accusations. You just cannot call someone a hypocrite and get, the, get away with it. Because by calling someone a hypocrite, you're saying basically that that person is a fraud, fake news, right? Um, he, he's living a lie. He is saying one thing and doing another. He is pretending to be someone he is not. And you know what? Sometimes um, the best people to spot hypocrisy are kids and our children, right? So if you are married, you understand that uh, children are the ones who, are, who best spot uh, our hypocrisy as parents. For example, as parents or as adults, we tell uh, kids, you know, uh, better sleep early, Okay, do not uh, continue on, uh, avoid, uh, you know, gadgets and stuff, or um, eat well, okay? But we ourselves as adults do the exact opposite of what we say. And for example, uh, my, one of my greatest critics would be my own daughter, okay? So, uh, of course, as a past, I don't know if that is because she's a pastor's kid. But it, of course, she knows that I'm a pastor. She hears, uh, she listens to my sermons whether out of duty or out of delight, I don't know. <laughs> but um, uh, she, so she listens to it. And then, of course, she can spot whenever I deviate or I fail to practice what I preach.
But sadly, hypocrisy is not just in our homes. Hypocrisy is also in the church. You know, the greatest and most persistent criticism against Christianity is hypocrisy. For example, if you invite some of your friends to church, some people would say, I don't want to go to church or to your church, you know, because Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. Have you ever heard those words? You know, probably in their past, uh, they have been, they have stumbled over some seemingly kitokto uh, or Christians who claim to be Christians, but they've lived a totally different life. And so they, they generalize that across the board and say, Christians are hypocrites. But they may, be, they may be right, they may be wrong. But did you know that in the Bible, a leader was called a hypocrite? See, not just, you know, not just lay people, but leaders could also be, um, you know, could also fall into that trap of hypocrisy. Uh, we, we did not get the chance to read the Bible. I thought that we had scripture reading. But anyway, we will read those scriptures. But just to tell you, uh, it's Paul, okay, who accused Peter of hypocrisy. If you would look at seniority, I don't mean seniority, right? If you would look at seniority, who's the more senior in the early church, Peter or Paul? Hmm. So I see Peter, right? Peter, right? Why? Why? Because basically he's one of the legitimate 12 disciples. He has been with Jesus ever since. He witnessed the baptism of John and on and on. He witnessed all that till the death and resurrection of Jesus. Okay, Paul just came in uh, in a unique way. He became an apostle in a unique way, uh, unlike the others who really witnessed Jesus Christ. And so you would say Peter is, you know, seniority-wise. Parang boksu, Paul would be, you know. But here was a someone who was, let's say, a fairly young uh, servant of the Lord, accusing someone who is already a pillar of the church of hypocrisy. So what led to that? What exactly led to that whole story? You know, the accusation of Paul against Peter is that, Peter, you're living out of line with the gospel. You're not living up to the gospel. And so the title of today's sermon is In Line with the Gospel. What does it mean not just to believe what is in line with the gospel, but what it is to live in line with the gospel. In our church right now, we are going through a series on Galatians. Galatians may be a very difficult book or letter to read. It is not really a, you know, a light reading. It is a heavy letter. Why do I say that? Because Paul writes this letter with a heavy heart, right? He, in fact, in, our, in his previous letters, he would always have a thanksgiving he would always say, thank you. I thank the Lord for you, church in Ephesus. I would thank the Lord for you, church in Philippi. But this, with the Galatian churches, he doesn't have a word of thanks. He goes straight to the point, and he, you know, he asks the Galatians, how can you deviate from the word of truth? How can you deviate from the gospel? And so today we are going to look exactly at what that means, how to, be, how to live in line with the gospel. Why don't we come to the Lord again in prayer? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, may you speak to us, O Lord, through your word, just like what we sang earlier. Prepare our hearts, Lord God. Speak to our hearts and to our minds, whether here or probably those who are watching online. And Father, we pray that your word will not come back to you without fulfilling its purpose in the lives of each one. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, Galatians was written by Paul. Uh, this was also a, uh, uh, this would be one of the dearest letters of Paul. Why? Because this is actually, scholars believe that this is actually his first letter. But your, your first would always be something precious to you. For example, if you write a book, your first book would be precious, right? Your first song, your first post on internet, whatever. It will always be precious. This is actually his first letter. And it, it was a result of his first missionary journey, okay? Paul and Barnabas went on the missionary journey. They went to the southern province of Galatia, uh, it, it, cities like Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. So he went to those places and um, basically ministered to them, okay? So, uh, and then when he came back to Jerusalem, people from Jerusalem went to Galatia and, star, and these were called Judaizers. They were called Judaizers because they were insisting that uh, for Gentiles, you see, Galatia is a, a Gentile nation. So for the Gentiles to truly be a full-pledged Christian, they had to observe Jewish customs and laws. 
particularly circumcision. So what they're saying is as, as soon as Paul and Barnabas left those cities and went back to Jerusalem, they went, they went to those cities and started to, you know, educate the new young believers, okay? And, you know, um, influence them to say that if you really want to be a full-fledged Christian, then you have to abide by some Jewish customs, Circum circumcision, the kosher food laws, you know, dietary laws, you know, the clean and unclean food with, uh, when it comes to the uh, Jewish people that's found in Deuteronomy, Leviticus. And also, you have to follow certain holy days, okay? So you have to do that to really be a full-fledged Christian. So that's what they're insisting. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is that you are saved, what? By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, okay? So say that with me. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Okay, that's very crucial in our understanding of the whole letter of Galatians, okay? And even our text for this morning. So, this complicated mixture of Judaism and Christianity began to affect a number of Christians in Galatia. Okay, some, some Christians, actually a lot of Christians, were starting to, become, to be influenced. But what is more tragic is that some leaders themselves were starting, to become, were starting to be influenced as well. And one of that is Peter. Paul witnessed how Peter was starting to live out of line with the gospel. Okay, and he, and he goes on and, and rebukes Peter. So this was a very awkward moment. There in Antioch, Paul rebukes Peter to his face, and even publicly, okay, telling him that you are a hypocrite, okay? Let's look at that. Galatians chapter 2, if you have your Bibles with you, but I think it's, it's also in the, uh, the PowerPoint. 2.11 says, but when Cephas, Cephas, okay, who is an Aramaic term, another name for Peter, when he came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Okay, so this is a very tense moment as Paul publicly rebukes Peter, and what is interesting, though, is if you look at the chapter before that, uh, I mean the, the, the passage before that in chapter 2, 1 to 10, you would find how Paul and Barnabas were acknowledged as apostles by the, by the very pillars that he was rebuking, right? So James, John, and the other pillars, when they came to Jerusalem, okay, uh, they, they were um, acknowledged as uh, apostles themselves, by the Jerusalem Council, okay? And so here, now, in this chapter, uh, in this verses 11 onwards, we find Paul rebuking Peter. And what was the rebuke? Verse 12. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles, but when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Now we are told from the moment Peter had arrived uh, in this place, in Antioch, he began eating together with the Gentiles. Now that is nothing new when it comes to Peter. Because, well, we understand Peter was a, an apostle to the Jews. Paul, per, Paul was an apostle to the Gentiles. However, Peter was the first apostle to minister to Gentiles. Remember the story of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10? That was Peter. At first, Peter was hesitant to go to Cornelius. Why? Because for the Jewish believer, even for believers, Jewish believers, they looked down on Gentiles as unclean. And so Paul, uh, rather God, came to uh, Peter in a vision telling him, do not call unclean what I consider to be clean. Okay? And so that's why he ministered to Cornelius and began eating with Cornelius and other, uh, other Gentiles for that matter. In, in fact, in Acts 11, Acts chapter 10 is where he ministered to uh, Cornelius. In Acts chapter 11, look at what it says. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also received the word of God. So when Peter came, went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party, take note of this, this is a critical party. This is the Judaizers, these are the circumcision party. They criticized Peter, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Okay? So notice the word eating is actually uh, in the imperfect tense, which tells us that it was a practice of Peter to eat with the Gentiles. Now, there are two occasions for Peter to actually eat with them. One is called the love feast. In the early church, there would be a love feast. Uh, scholars are debating whether this is actually the Lord's Supper or not. But some scholars say that it's not. It's another. Meaning that, you know, after service, or in fact, the whole service revolves around that. They would have the preaching of the word, 
And after the preaching of the word, they would also have a feast together. And the purpose of that is for fellowshipping. Okay? Uh, in our church in Kaloocan, we, would, we, we have that. We don't call it love feast. Love feast, we just call it lunch fellowship. But the purpose why we do that is because we want to continue to engage the members in fellowship. Right? So that's what we do. But that's not the only occasion. Another, other occasions where Peter could be eating with Gentiles would be eating in their homes. Okay? So these Gentiles, okay, come to their homes and eat with them. So, you know, you don't eat with someone you don't like, right? You don't eat with someone that you feel uncomfortable with. You eat only with someone, you dine with someone whom you, ha you have a close affinity with, you want to fellowship with, right? Uh, nowadays, uh, especially this year, latter part of this year, we're starting to resume eat out, right? Let's hang out, let's eat. We, we missed that for two years, haven't we, right? We, we, we rarely go, went out with other people during the first two years of this epidemic, probably because of fear or whatever reason. Now you see a lot of people going to Starbucks together, hanging out together, going to Chinese restaurants together, whatever. So eating with them is a part of what Peter was doing, okay? But then what happened? There was a sudden change. He began to separate himself. Actually, that word separating himself is a gradual separation, okay? He separated himself. He began to withdraw from them. What, is it, what, what led him to withdraw from this group, right? Um, you know, this, this term withdrawing is kind of, it's kinda, let, me, let me illustrate it for you. Uh, if you, for example, if you watch uh, teen films, like, for example, if you watch films or, or series, Netflix series, which involves high school students or college students, what do you find in, um, in high school or college scenes? You find basically groups, right? You find the groups like the jocks. I don't know if you still call them jocks. And you have nerds. You have basically the in-group, okay? And you have the bullied group or the out-group, whatever, okay? So if you want to be in, you make sure that you do not sit and eat with the rejects. Sorry for the term. That's just what they call them, right? So you don't go out with the bullied ones. If you get to associate with the bullied ones, you get bullied yourself. So, for example, you see scenes on, on video, right, where they start to eat. For example, you would start to eat with them. They invite you over. And then you look around and you see the, the, the kind of uh, peer group you want to be a part of, the in-group. And they see you eating with this group. So what do you do? Well, or what does the character do in the film? They would what? Withdraw. Or... Or in some occasions, as, as this, uh, this out-group, okay, or bullet group would be inviting you, and then you see the other group, your tendency is, even though they may be your friends, what happens? You start to avoid them just to be with the other group, right? So that's what Peter has done. He has usually ate with this group, and all of a sudden, because of the group from James, because of the circumcision group, right, he avoided them altogether and made sure not to eat with them. And what, what is interesting, though, is the reason for their hypocrisy. What led Peter to gradually withdraw and separate himself? Look at verse 12 again. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. Okay? So what, the cause of Peter's hypocrisy was fear. Okay? Fear. And you know what? A lot of times, what causes us to compromise is fear. Let's look at Proverbs. Look at what Solomon says in Proverbs 29. The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. What the fear of man does to us is in that it entraps us to the point that we are unable to obey the Lord because we end up obeying man rather than God. Okay? You fear rejection. You, you fear rejection from your peers. <clears throat> so you, are comp you compromise. Okay? Example na lang. School, tao kwa. Okay? You don't cheat. But then your peers or your friends pressure you to. Okay? And you know deep down inside, what happens? If I don't let, if I don't, you know, let them cheat, what happens? 
they avoid you. And so you lose your friend. And you know what that basically means? That's fear of men. Fear of rejection. Fear of ridicule. And fear of anything, right? So a lot of us do that. For example, if your boss would, would force you to compromise in your business dealings, and you compromise, what is that? It probably be fear of your boss or fear of losing your job, okay? So those fears can entrap you to become a hypocrite, to become other than what you are. See, the bottom line with Peter is this. He never changes belief. If you were to ask Peter, what is your theology regarding Gentiles? Are they really saved even though they do not take part in Jewish customs? Peter would be vocal and say, yes. Gentiles do not need to follow. They don't need to be circumcised to be saved. They don't need to follow these dietary laws to be saved. They, you know, God saves them in, by grace alone through faith alone, in Christ alone. But then what is, what is his action saying? What is his new action saying? By withdrawing from them, what is he saying? They're not actually Christians. They're not full-pledged Christians. Okay, so I cannot really associate with them. You, you get what I'm saying? Okay, so that's the problem. Look at Acts 5.29. Look at Peter before. Acts 5.29. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. This was way earlier, Acts 5, okay? And this was the situation, this, this was Peter who courageously declared he would rather obey God than man when he was being pressured by the high priest not to preach in Christ's name. There was a pressure from the high priest, do not preach, stop preaching. And Peter said, who am I? Uh, who am I to obey, you or God? I would rather obey God than men. And a few chapters away, he began to obey men rather than God. Okay? So Peter's behavior changed because he feared the circumcision group. Peer pressure could be, cause us to be inconsistent. Our beliefs do not change, but out of fear, we change our behavior, which becomes inconsistent with our beliefs. Now, it's easy to criticize Peter. We can say, Peter, how could you? You're a pillar of the church, right? Of all people, you know that Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors. Could you go back to that story? Who did Jesus eat with? He ate with what? Sinners, tax collectors, publicans, prostitutes. He ate with them. And that really irritated the Jewish, uh, antagonized the Pharisees and Sadducees, isn't it? Huh? And Jesus exemplified that lifestyle to Peter. But then again, somehow, Peter deviated. And so we could say, Peter, you know, you were with Jesus. You did not just hear it. You saw it with your eyes. How could you? Okay, but look at this. Luther, in his commentary in Galatians, says this. No man standing is so secure that he may not fall. If Peter fell, I may fall. If he rose again, I may rise again. We have the same gift that they had the same Christ, the same baptism, and the same gospel, the same forgiveness of sins. So before we point a finger at Peter and say, Peter, how could you? We have to also look at our own lives. Because in so many ways, we compromise. In so many ways, we give in to peer pressure. In so many ways, we end up becoming hypocrites ourselves. Now, what is the, the problem now is, it's not just Peter who ended up acting this way. Peter was a pillar and his actions influenced others. Right? Let's, let's look at the result of Peter's hypocrisy. Verse 13, And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Peter being the pillar was able to influence the Jewish believers to disassociate themselves as well. So it's not just Peter... The other Jewish Christians who may not be Judaizers, who may not be from the circumcision group, when they saw Peter avoiding this group, what did they do? If Peter does it, we should as well, right? And then Paul singled out Barnabas. Why did he single out Barnabas? Because, because Barnabas, by following Peter's actions and hypocrisy, was one of the biggest blow to Peter. Remember what I said earlier? 
Peter's, uh, Paul's companion in his first missionary journey was Barnabas. So Pete, Paul and Barnabas were the ones who ministered to this group. They were his, their products. These Gentile groups were their products. And so for Barnabas to suddenly disassociate himself is a big blow, right? Right? You evangelize them and then you start to leave them. That's why that's the big blow for Paul. Okay? Now, but the hypocrisy of Peter is not just... Uh, but what we see here now then is the rebuttal against Peter's hypocrisy. Verse 14. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, or Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like a Jew? So let's look at that verse. First, that verse was not in step with the truth of the gospel. Okay? Was not in step with the truth of the gospel. I, I highlighted that for one reason. That word, literally in Greek, is the word orthopodiuo. Orthopodiuo. From which we get the word, can you guess? Orthopodiuo. A branch of medicine. Orthopedic. Right? Orthopedic. Basically, literally, it means to be straight-footed. If you are straight-footed, it means you walk the straight path. Okay? So, Paul is saying, when I saw that Peter and other Jewish believers, when I saw they were not being straight-footed with the truth of the gospel, when their foot is not straight, you begin to deviate from the path, right? You start to veer away. Let's look at how other translations do it. In other translations, this is how it's said. When I saw that they were not walking a straight path in line with the truth of the gospel, that they were not on the right road in line with the truth of the gospel, or they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. So Paul saw the issue for what it was. It was about the truth of the gospel. The real problem of Peter, by his actions, in turning away from the, is in fact turning away from the truth of the gospel. He was declaring through his actions that the only way for Gentile believers to have true to, be, to have fellowship with the Jewish Christians, like himself, was to become like a Jew. You get it? Paul, uh, Peter, by withdrawing himself from the Gentiles, is saying, wait a minute, I was wrong. I associated with you before, but I realize now by my actions that you're not really full-pledged Christians until you become like us, Jews. Okay, that's what he's saying. And that's walking out of line with the truth of the gospel, okay? You're not aligned with the truth, okay? Aligned, you have, your life should be aligned with the truth. You know, the, the image that comes to mind is, uh, you know, when you're driving a car and your wheels are not aligned. What happens to your car if your wheels are not properly aligned? You what? You veer away, right? You don't, you're not driving a straight path. All of a sudden, you start to see that if you release your hand from the, steering wheel, your car begins to deviate, right? And that's what, you, that's what happens when you're not living, believing in line with the gospel and when you're not living in line with the gospel. Let me, declare, let me share this. Um, this is something I shared as we started our series in Galatians in our church. The gospel is not something that you... Build, uh, the, the, the gospel is not just something you believe in. The gospel is not something you just believe, but, some, but a life to be lived. It's not a truth to believe. It's not just a truth to believe, but a life to be lived. Okay, let me say that again. The gospel is not just a truth to believe, but a life to be lived. Okay, very crucial to understand that. Because we might think the gospel is something you just understand and live. I understand the gospel. I believe the gospel. But it's not just something you believe in. It has to be a life that you lived in. The Bible doesn't call us just to believe in Jesus, but to live for Him as well. Now, the truth of the gospel that Paul talks about in verse 14 stands in opposition to the message Peter was sending. The truth of the gospel tells us that no one can keep the law, that our only hope is to receive the righteousness of Christ. The gospel is not about what you and I can do, but what about Jesus has already done. The gospel is not about our trying, but our trusting. Okay? It's not in our trying to become a Christian. It's in trusting in the works of Christ. 
for us to be Christians. Now he says, if you, though you are a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like, a, like Jews? Paul's point is this, Peter, you've been living like a Gentile. You made no distinction between Jews and non-Jews. How can you now insist by your behavior, insist that Gentiles become Jews, okay? So Peter, you have already, you know already what it means to live like Gentiles. The most important thing is whether you, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile, you are a believer in Christ. But now, why is it that you are insisting by avoiding them, you are insisting then that they should become and they should like live like Jews, okay? So Paul first reminded Peter that he himself did not live under strict obedience to the law of Moses. So why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? So the question we need to ask ourselves is this. Are you and I, are we walking in step with the truth of the gospel or are you veering off into gospel hypocrisy? We veer because we fear. We veer away because we fear what others might think. We fear of being rejected, fear of losing uh, probably friends or losing, um, losing anything. And like Peter, we can also, so uh, often our error can influence others as well. So let us now look at Paul who exemplifies what it means to live in line with the gospel. That's the second point. Paul's living in line with the gospel. Galatians 2.15, it says, We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Now, if you look at that verse, the next verse, sorry, is it there? Galatians 2.15, yeah. Uh, sorry. No, before that, I saw it. Th that one, that one. Yeah, there, okay. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. If you look at that verse, you might think, Paul, what are you saying? Are you, you know, it, it seems like Paul is saying, well, we are Gentiles, you gen, uh, we are Jews, you Gentiles are sinners. <clears throat> That's not his point. His point is basically say, saying this. From the time I was born, I was exposed to the teachings of the law. I know, I, I've been a Jew by birth. Okay, so that is a privilege. I know the law. I live by the law. I ate the law. I, I, I was born with the law. But Paul is saying, not just me, but we who are Jews by birth, we realize that we are not saved by becoming Jews. Okay? We are not saved by following the Jewish customs and laws. It was not that that saved them. Jesus Christ saved them. It wasn't their obedience to the law. It was Christ's obedience. They were justified in Christ. That is the truth of the gospel. Verse 16. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ. So also we have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. So the plain truth is this. You and I cannot be good enough. There's no amount of good works that can tip the scale in our favor. We cannot earn our way through good works, right? You know, uh, I'm sure, probably not here, probably uh, Pastor Stephen has really taught you about the basic truth of this gospel. But I hear a lot of Christians who, when, you, when you ask them, you know, how are you saved? And they know, they know they're saved by grace through faith. And then they, you would ask them, well, how do you continue to be saved? And then, or how can you be assured of, oh, no, the question is, how can you be sure of your salvation? And sometimes you would hear Christians still say, you know, um, besides I make sure that I study my Bible, I read my Bible, I pray, you know, I go to church, I share. No, those are spiritual disciplines. What our presider mentioned earlier, those are spiritual disciplines. But the spiritual disciplines are the fruit of your salvation. They're not the means to your salvation. Am I right? Okay. I always point out, it's not, in, it's not there. I always point out the verse in Philippians. Uh, where Paul says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But if you look at that verse alone, you might think that the only way for you to keep, to keep your salvation is to work it out. Okay? But... Take note that there is a verse right after that. Okay, that verse is not complete. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. So, without God's enablement, without God's strength, without God's grace working in us, 
you will not really be able to live out the Christian life. So you are saved by grace through faith. You continue on in the Christian life by grace through faith. And you are assured of your salvation no matter what happens by grace through faith. Am I right? Uh, you, you understand this? So you, so, but a lot of people somehow understand the first part, but then they, they can't perceive, they can't conceive of the idea that even, if, even my continuing in my faith is, really, is still the work of God, it's still by grace, but it's very clear from God's Word. Now, the word justified is, uh, is a legal term that means to be acquitted or to be declared innocent or to be right with God. Okay, that's the basic point. To be, uh, to be justified is to be made right with God. So look at this verse, Galatians 2.16. Okay, and um, yeah, that's it. Okay, and let's read it with this idea in mind. If you read it this way, it becomes clear. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not made right with God by works of the law, but through faith in Christ. So also we have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be made right with God by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be what? Made right with God. So the question is, how can, we, how can we be made right with God? Is it by the works of the law or by faith? It says there, by works of the law, no one can be made right with God. So it's not by obedience to the law. Okay? So in support of this, Paul emphasizes in uh, 3.10, the obligation to do all that the law requires. It's not there, but if you go to Galatians 3.10, it says there that if we live by the law, we should obey every law. Let me ask you, who among you here are able to obey all the laws of God consistently? That's difficult, isn't it? Right? For example, let's, let's go to the Ten Commandments na lang. I don't know if you memorized the Ten Commandments, but let's think about a command from the Bible. Of course, the very first command we know is uh, you should, you know, uh, you have, shall have no other gods before me. Okay, but let's look at more day-by-day uh, -day day things. And one of the, one of the uh, you know, one of the more practical law of the, law of the Ten Commandments would be you should honor your father and mother. Okay? So who among you here have honored your father and mother throughout your entire life from a kid to an adult? Who among you have obeyed <laughs> them consistently. Now, that's difficult, right? And then you ask a person, uh, w w uh, part, of the law, part of the Ten Commandments says, you know, you should not give false witness. In essence, you should not lie. And then you, uh, you, you throw the question, who among you here have never lied in their, throughout their entire life? Ubo, mpat kong petsakwe. That's difficult, right? Because the moment you raise your hand, that's already a lie. And that's a big lie. Because at some point, some lang, ha, that's a mild way of putting it, at some point in our life, we lied. And probably even now, we continue to lie. So we cannot be saved by works of the law. No amount of law keeping can make a person righteous. Romans 3, verse 20, For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. You know what the law does? It, the law only reveals your sin, but it cannot save you from it. That's what the law does. It reveals sin. Okay? I, I liken that to a, um, uh, to a city scan or a city stonogram or whatever. Recently, I had a city stonogram. Okay? If, you, if, if you know that, if you've ever been through that, that looks at your kidney, and basically your bladder, and to see if there are stones, okay? Um, hindi nyo lang alam, mayaman ako. Kasi uh, nagpo-form ako ng stone. <laughs> yun lang nga, Tatsyo, yun lang nga yung stone ng bato. Kung diamond lang yun, mayaman na ako, no? But so I have to be very careful with my diet. I'm a, uh, doctors call me a stone former. Yung kidney stones. Okay, so from time to time, I have to monitor. Okay? So what if I go through that CT stonogram, that CT scan, and the technician, you know, I just, just out loud, the technician would, I would ask the technician, did you see anything? Okay? And then let's say there's a radiologist there as well. They say, yeah, it's very clear there. Okay? It's kind of big already. 
Can I say to the to the doctor, Doc, pwede ba dito, uh, you know, can you remove it through this machine? Hindi pwede, di ba? Because the CT, scan, the CT scan, the purpose of it is just to be able to detect abnormalities, to, be, to detect whatever is there. But it doesn't remove it, right? So that's what the law does. It reveals your sin. It shows you that we are sinners, that we cannot really save ourselves, that we need someone externally from us to save us, okay? So that's the point. So the law is important as a mirror to show us our sinfulness. But to reveal it, but not to remove it. But the good news is, is in Romans 3, 28, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So what is faith in Christ? Okay? Paul says it's impossible to win our own salvation. The only way is to be, to be set right with God is by the works of Christ. Okay? So this is uh, Jesus, the one who justifies us. How does he justify? Not through our obedience, but through his obedience. Okay, the saving faith we need is the saving faith God gives. So what, is it by, what does it mean to live by faith? Okay? Let's look at what living by faith is not. First, living by faith is not a license to sin. Verse 17, But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too are found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I reveal what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Right? What Paul's critics were claiming in their accusation against Paul was this. They were saying to Paul, Paul, if you say that we are saved by grace alone, then we don't have to do anything, right? Paul says, yes, you don't have to do anything to be saved. Okay, I mean, you, don't have to, you cannot earn your way to be saved. You have, what, the only thing you can do is to put your faith in Christ. Okay, so they would say, well, that's it. That, so if everything has been done for us, then why do anything at all? Why not just relax? Why not sin? Grace will cover it all. Okay, if God justifies bad people, what is the point of being good? Can't we do as we like and live as we please? That's a statement by John Stott. And so armed with this thinking, Paul's critics were claiming that the apostle was making Christ a servant of sin, literally an enabler of sin. Parang sinasabi niya, Paul, by doing that, parang sinasabi mo na rin that Christ is, you know, encouraging you to sin. Okay? Kasi anytime naman, you can ask for forgiveness. And, you know, what's the point? You are saved anyway. Okay? But Paul is saying, no, certainly not. The gospel of grace doesn't encourage us to live a life of sin. Okay? Uh, Paul cannot be more emphatic. A license to sin is a false implication. Okay? So, for example... Okay. Just because Christians aren't saved by our good deeds, it doesn't mean we shouldn't bother to be good. So imagine if, I, if, I, uh, if you go on a beach. Okay? Let's say if I went to, just recently, my, life, my family and I went to a beach. Okay? So imagine we went there, and um, I, went, uh, I went to the far deep end, and I started to drown. Okay? The lifeguard was able, by God's grace, the lifeguard was able to see me and rescued me. So I would be forever grateful to that lifeguard. I would say, thank you, thank you, how can I repay you, whatever, right? But what if, after saying all that thing, you know, I, I, would, I would, you know, I'm forever grateful, I realized I could not swim that far, that deep. What if after all this is done, I go back to the deep end and I swim again? Okay? That would be stupid and seriously ungrateful. In similar fashion, as Paul wrote in Galatians, Jesus rescued us from sin. By his death on the cross, he has taken away the penalty of our sin. How foolish it would be for us to return to our past life and continue to live that kind of sin. Are you with me here? If we really grasp what Jesus has done, we will want to live a life that pleases him. We don't want to go back to our old ways. We don't want to go back to a life that destroyed us in the first place. So if Paul rejects that notion that faith alone is a reckless idea, that leads to spiritual indifference, but he also rejects the idea that following all the rules will make us right with God, then what can he tell the Galatians about the life that we now live? What does it mean to live by faith? Living by faith is living for God. Galatians 2, 19. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Okay? Now take note. The law did not die. Okay? The law itself killed Paul. It showed him that he never could live up to the law. So what this verse is saying is, 
when, the, when, the, when, it, when Paul says, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God, it's saying basically, it did not say the law died. Wala nang effect ang law. What it's saying is, for through the law, I recognize that I cannot be saved by the law, so that freed me to live for God. Okay? So to die to the law, is, uh, John Calvin said, to die to the law is to renounce it and to be freed from its dominion. So that we have no confidence in it, it does not hold us captive under the yoke of slavery. Okay? So, I, through the law, died to the law that I might be free to live to God. I'm no longer under slavery. I'm not subject to the law. Which reminds me, today is actually a holiday, right? What holiday is today? Independence Day, right? A beautiful term, Independence Day. Freedom. It's a day of freedom. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. The moment that you receive Christ by, uh, by grace, by His grace through faith, you are set free from the law, okay? And, uh, and its demands. You are not no longer under law, but under grace. Just like when in our independence day, supposedly we were no longer, well, June 12, that time, we were no longer under Spanish rule, but we were set free. Kaya lang yung June 12, medyo ano yun, historically. Kasi we were set free from Spanish rule, but we, were, we became literally subject to American rule. No? Kaya nga yung iba, sabi nila in July 4 daw mas appropriate kasi that was when basically we were given through independence. But whatever. But we celebrate Independence Day June 12. So that's, so that's what it means. You're no longer subject to this, but you are free to live under this sovereignty, under God's sovereignty. So what does it mean to live in light of the gospel? This is where we'll end. Paul said this in Galatians 2.20, and I believe this, is, this verse is familiar to all of us. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I live now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, Paul anticipates a question. Paul, when did you die to the law? You're, you pretty much are alive, right? And you, Paul said, you know, the, when did I die to the law? The moment that I have been crucified with Christ. Okay? When I have been crucified with Christ, I no longer live, but Christ lived in me. Okay? Uh, who among here have been baptized? Okay? How do you conduct baptism here? Immerse. Okay? Just like us, Baptists, <laughs> of course, we, we basically promote immersion. Okay? But, oh, of course, I acknowledge that there are some who sprinkle. But uh, immersion is a beautiful picture. Why? Because in immersion, usually the pastor says, you died with Christ, you're raised to new life. Okay? So that's identifying with Christ. You're dying with Christ. You're crucified with Christ. Therefore, you no longer live, but Christ lives in you. So you go back to that beautiful picture uh, you go back to the time when you were baptized, when you were immersed in water, and we came out of the water. You identified with Christ's death, so you identify with Christ's resurrection life. Amen? So that's the beauty. That's what it means. He died, and I died to the law. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives, lives in me. Since we died with Christ on the cross, we have a different life. The moment that we identify with Christ, it's no longer us who live, but Christ who lives in us. Now, it doesn't mean we become robots. It doesn't mean all of a sudden you lose your sense of identity. All of a sudden, you know, uh, Joselito no longer becomes Joselito. No. But it simply means now that my identity is not found in who I was, but who I am in Christ. My identity is now find, found in Christ. That's why you are called a Christian. You bear the name of Christ. Paul realized that on the cross, a great exchange occurred. He gave Jesus his old, you know, tried to be right before God by the law life. It was crucified on the cross. Then Jesus gave Paul his life to Christ. A Christ, a life lived by the grace of the Lord. Now David Platt, uh, Pastor David Platt puts it this way. He said, when Paul says he has been crucified with Christ, he's virtually saying it's not the same me anymore. It's not the I that tried to work for God and failed every time. Not the I that throughout through the world revolved, thought the world revolved around him, 
the pride of the old, I directed everything to focus on self-esteem, self-confidence, self-direction, self-exaltation. And it lived for personal pleasure and position. But my life is no longer about me, Paul says, because Christ lives in me. This is where the key of faith comes in. Paul can now only manage the new life Jesus gave him by faith. You cannot live the new life Jesus gives on the foundation of law-keeping. You can only live it by faith. Okay? So true faith is not just an intellectual belief. It is a transformed life. It is a life surrendered to God. Okay? It's not a life of license to sin, but a license to freedom. I do not live to earn God's love. I live to trust the one who loved me and gave himself for me. This is beautiful. You know, I live for the one who loved me and gave... Let's go back to that verse earlier. Galatians 2.20. It says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Right? What confidence Paul has to live for the Lord. Why? Because it, this is the same God who loved him and gave himself. So think about that. This is not... You're not living, you're not living for someone who doesn't love you, doesn't care for you. You're living for someone who loved you to the point that he gave himself for you. That's why you are able to say, I will live my life for him. If you were to ask Paul to introduce himself, I believe he might introduce himself this way. I'm crucified, therefore I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The dominant reality shaping Paul's life had nothing to do with his hobbies, his accomplishments, the dominant reality of Paul's life was Christ. Christ is how Paul thought about himself. So when we live with that, with that dominant reality, and if that reality shapes our life, right? Why are you doing what you're doing now? It's no longer I. It's no longer I who live this life. It's Christ who lives in me. So when you encounter temptations to compromise, what do you say? I cannot do that. Because it's no longer I. If it were I who live, I would do it. But Christ lives in me. So why would I do it? Christ would never do it. Right? If you just live by that mantra, so many things would change in your life, wouldn't it? Why would I cheat my way through business? It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Why would I commit this sexual sin? It's no longer I who live, but Christ. Would Christ do it? Right? Why would I look at that picture or that video? Why would I cheat my way through? Why would I not forgive? Why would I mock? Why would I, why would I do certain, certain, certain things, these things if it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me? In the same manner, if obedience to God is so difficult, you can say in your heart of hearts, it's no longer I. If it were just me, I could not do it. Forgive, I could not do that. Share the gospel, I could not do that. You know, trust in God through this cancer, through this difficulty, I could not do that. But it is no longer I who live, but what? Christ who lives in me. The life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If he gave himself for me, what else could he not give? Amen? Galatians 2.20, if we just put that into our hearts, then the life that we live will be a life of faith. You know, Peter learned this lesson. His hypocrisy in Antioch was only a temporary lapse, not a permanent mistake. We know this because in just a short time, back in Jerusalem, Peter stood up in front of his fellow, fellow apostles and a whole church council and told them that Gentiles as well as Jews are saved by faith alone. You can read that in Acts chapter 15. Because the letter was written before Acts 15, okay? So the events were ha that happened were in Acts uh, 13 and 14. Acts 15 happened after the letter to Galatians. So Peter told the Jerusalem council that full fellowship between Christian Jews and Gentiles was correct because of their common faith in Christ. So we thank the Lord for Paul's courage to confront Peter. As Paul confronted Peter, uh, 
through that, Peter and we learn the following. One, we should, never be, we should never stray from the truth of the gospel by the fear of man. We should never compromise our faith out of fear of rejection, ridicule, bullying, whatever. Or fear of loss, fear of security, because our security and our hope lies not in ourselves, not in our resources, not in our relationships, but in Christ alone. Amen? Secondly, we are justified by faith, not by works. Our good deeds cannot save us. Only Christ can. But our good deeds are the result, are the fruits, right, of God working in us to will and to act according to His good purpose. Lastly, living by faith is not a license to sin, but it gives us liberty, freedom, independence to live a life surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. If we have been saved by Christ, we can and should live for Him as He lives His life in us. No longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. As we close, I want you to think about this. We're about to close. As I close in prayer, I just want you to think about this. What are you facing right now in life? I don't know what you're facing, okay? But you may be facing a struggle. You may have doubts. You may have fears. Now we have fears. Fears about your health. Fears about your finances. But definitely there's so much to fear now about finances, especially with the world economy going down. Fear about your friends. Probably the Lord is telling you to do something for Him. To just simply obey a commandment that you find it difficult to obey simply because you feel that by doing so, then you lose out on something else. What is that? And I want you to go back to Galatians 2.20. What does it mean for you as you face that problem, difficulty, or challenge to say, my life has been crucified with Christ. The old has gone, the new has come. My sinful life, my, my, you know, my self-dependent life has been gone, been crucified. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I live now, I live by faith, complete trust in the one who loved me and gave himself for me. So whom should I fear? Is there a reason to fear? What should I worry about? Is there a reason to worry? Why should I compromise? Is there any reason to do so? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share God's word to my brothers and sisters here at uh, Light of Faith Tabernacle. Lord, I don't know what storms or difficulties or challenges they may be facing right now. But through it all, I pray that the truth of the gospel is something that we just not believe in, but live in and live for. That we recognize, Lord, that we have been crucified with our Savior. So therefore, it is no longer we who live. Because if we are left to ourselves, it would be difficult to obey. It would be easy to sin. But it is Christ who lives in us. The very same Christ who loves us, who loved us and continues to love us and gave himself for us so that we could live a life of faith by grace in Christ alone. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So, uh, we... Thank you for uh, the off-repeat reminder shared to us by Pastor uh, 
Sedito Chua about uh, how we should approach our Christian life, Christian faith, that uh, by keeping in line, <laughs> okay, not offline, <laughs> okay, keep in step, not out of step, in sync and not out of sync, out of sync, okay, with the, with the, uh, you know, how we should approach our life, because I think, yeah, I absolutely agree, and I that we do to do that. It's not enough that we uh, know the truth, the gospel, the gospel of truth. Not just intellectually, you know, by reading, understanding, but by exper experientially. Meaning to say is so that we should live out, apply it in our lives. And through the combination of intellectual and experiential, okay, so this is, uh, this we can, you know, work, work out our salvation, okay, uh, work out our salvation. And we as Christians uh, in our various stages of uh, you know, we are all work in progress in the various stages of our spiritual development. And uh, we should always pray for God's grace and mercy, okay, to uh, help us work out our salvation. Okay, so as we grow uh, in the full knowledge and full maturity to be Christ-like. At this point, I'd like to call our ushers, okay, Brother Michael, Sister Elinita, for our tithes and offerings. for our prayer, the offerings. Heavenly Father, once again, Lord, we thank you. And uh, we recognize that uh, everything that we have belongs to you. We thank you for your teaching about generosity and cheerful giving. Your word says, that the earth is yours and everything in it, and that you take, you give, and you take away. Now we offer, uh, we offer these uh, tithes and offerings, and uh, so that uh, help us to help us to use this uh, these resources and enable this church, Lord to apply and observe the biblical principles of stewardship, to continue blessing others, to reach out to the lost, and to support its ministries, and for the further advancement of your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. So once again, we uh, let's acknowledge for uh, the, uh, the presence of uh, the wife, okay, Jocelyn, uh, the wife of uh, Pastor uh, Chua, Jocelyn, and uh, their daughter, okay, Jenny, okay. And uh, just a couple of announcements, no? So the first one is uh, being uh, next Sunday, okay, so it's the third Sunday, and we all know it's a Father's Day, no? So our guest speaker will be Pastor Benson Tolentino. Okay, and for the second announcement, I think uh, this is just a repeat. So our uh, church anniversary is in July. Okay, so that's a few weeks away, and it's always uh, it's always celebrated on the first Sunday of July. But since many of us are will not be here, so it's been uh, moved to uh, the third Sunday. No, so it's July uh, 17. 
Okay, so it's uh, the 12th, no, the 12th year, no, anniversary of our church. Okay, and uh, we, uh, I understand that we will be giving away uh, uh, tickets. Okay, just a way of uh, confirm, confirming, no, the head counts, no, of uh, who will be be able to 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 to, us, to attend, no, the uh, that that uh, love this celebration. And uh, let's just wait for further announcement as to the venue and to the exact okay program. Okay. So at this point, I'd like to call again, okay, Pastor Aslito Kichua for the prayer benediction. Shall we all say, Tate, Kiri, please all stand. Now may the God of peace who brought us from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through jesus christ to whom be glory forever and ever in the name of father son holy spirit amen